All right, we're going to go ahead and talk just a little bit about the French Revolution today. Uh, we want to go ahead and talk first about some of the causes, uh, some of the political causes. Now, one of the things that really led into the French Revolution was the French king was an absolute monarch. In other words, the king was the one who made up the laws, the king was the one who enforced the laws, the king was ultimately the one who put people in prison. It was all his authority that, that, that the entire justice system was derived from. So again, he, he had control over absolute everything, uh, absolutely everything. Also, the people who the king relied on to help him carry out these things uh, were selected not by merit, but rather by birth. In other words, they weren't selected because they were good at what they did. They were selected because of who they were born to. Uh, and this didn't actually make for very efficient government. In fact, uh, the government a lot of times wasn't, wasn't good at the things it was doing because the people who were involved in doing it weren't exactly the best people sometimes. Also, the king was fond of censoring uh, both freedom of speech and freedom of press. Uh, this was oppressive. People felt like they didn't have a chance to criticize and offer their their voice uh, to the to the rules and to the laws that affected their lives. Also, evidence of this would be the fact that the king kept political prisoners for an indefinite period of time. So, in other words, if you spoke out against the king, uh, that was treason. You were put into prison until the king decided he didn't want you in prison anymore. Uh, so, there was no real sentence that said you had this long or whatever. It was just a, on the king's whim, whatever he felt. So, ultimately, the the main political problem here was that the people did not have a voice in their government. There were also then social problems. Uh, some of the big social problems can be evidenced in what are called the three estates. The three estates were the clergy, which was the first estate, the aristocracy, which was the second estate, and then the commoners, uh, which were your peasants, your merchants, um, your tradesmen, your artisans, things like that. Uh, and the commoners made up easily, um, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the population. The clergy and the aristocracy you know, maybe 10% of the population, maybe not even that, maybe even lower down to five. So really most of the people were commoners and most of the people had a very small voice. And there really wasn't an opportunity, at least not much of one, to change between the different estates. Theoretically, you could go ahead, if you were a commoner, you could become a clergy and you could move into a different estate. But really you had no chance of becoming aristocracy. If you were a commoner, you were pretty much stuck as a commoner at the bottom of the social scale. So that was a social problem, lack of social mobility. Again, the first and second estates, uh, I have here three percent of the population. They were the ones who almost who also owned most of the land. Most of your peasants, most of your commoners, didn't own land. The church owned an awful lot of land. That's your your clergy, and then of course the aristocracy. Uh, the peasants then had to end up paying most of the taxes. However, so so even though they didn't own much of the land, um, they were the ones who had to support the king uh, and the aristocracy. The aristocracy would collect feudal dues. Uh, the the, um, and the peasants would end up paying them. The, the aristocracy and the church themselves paid almost nothing in taxes. So their contribution to the government was next to nothing. Uh, they held all the best government jobs. They held all the best military pr privileges. Uh, and, and the privileges made it seem as if, and in fact, in some cases it actually kind of almost was, the aristocracy, the clergy were above the law. They made the law. They made it to their advantage. And when things didn't work out for them well with the law, they'd go ahead and just change it. Uh, so again, this, this made for a significant problem, a significant disconnect between the different social classes. There were also massive economic problems in France that led to this revolution. Uh, the king had spent a lot of money on foreign wars, on different things, and so uh, France had accumulated massive debts, and so much so that they weren't able to get any more loans. So the French government started to basically shut down uh, because, again, the debt had become so large that other people weren't willing to lend them any more money. Uh, so that became a huge problem. It's really one of the things that led to the to the fall of the French monarchy. Also, because the third estate bore almost the entire tax burden, they were resentful uh, of this. Um, they had to pay land taxes. Uh, another way that they uh, had taxes collected on them was they had forced labor, so they had to go work to pay off tax debt. Uh, they were taxed on everything all the way down to salt, so even the most common items uh, they were taxed on. And so they paid a huge amount of the taxes all over the place. Not only the taxes, but then the church collected money from them uh, in the form of the tithe, 10% uh, of whatever they made, the church collected. So that was, a, again, kind of like an additional tax. Feudal dues, dues they had to pay to their local landlord. So they were paying taxes to the king. The king could request labor from them. The king put ta taxes on everything from salt. The church collected money in the form of tithes. Uh, the feudal lords collected dues from them. And all of this got really burdensome, especially to one particular group of the third estate the bourgeoisie, the middle class. These were your business owners. These were your tradesmen. They were members of the third estate. Uh, and they had to pay all these taxes. On top of that, they had to pay tariffs. 
There were guild restrictions placed on manufacturing, so basically government regulations, hoops they had to jump through that made it hard for the, harder for them to earn money. They had government regulations on merchants, people buying stuff. And so all these regulations on trade and on manufacturing really put a pinch on the bourgeoisie. And these a lot of times were fairly wealthy people. Uh, and they resented the fact they couldn't influence these laws that were really hurting them, that were really affecting them negatively in significant ways. Another big thing that affected not so much the bourgeoisie, but really the, the, the commoners, the peasants, was uh, the inflation of the price of food. Uh, food, uh, as basically what was happening as the, the more and more debt was accrued, the money supply increased, and that increased um, inflation. And so as the money became worth less, it took more money to buy stuff. And this particularly applied to food. Uh, and this presented a huge problem as people couldn't afford to feed themselves now all of a sudden, hey, it's one thing if you're you know getting heavily taxed, whatever. When you can't feed your family, that turns into a big problem. The French bourgeoisie then, what they were advocating, what they wanted was laissez-faire. Uh, they wanted no government regulation. They didn't want regulations on the, just let us work. Uh, also, French philosophers played a big role in in promoting this. Uh, the American Revolution, the French people looked at that and said, hey, if they can throw off the monarch, so can we. Uh, and the French government itself. Uh, the French government was incompetent because it was incompetent, in large part because it was, you know, they picked their ministers by birth, not by competency. Um, they were unpopular, and they had two successively weak kings, Louis the Fifteenth and Louis the Sixteenth. Louis the Sixteenth and Louis the Fifteenth together uh, bankrupt the country. They support things like the American Revolution that really they probably didn't have money to do, although we're thankful they did it. Um, but again, it ends up leading to a, a, a bankrupting of the country. So what happens? So they have this huge financial crisis. They have all these social problems. The king of France, Louis XVI, who was not a great king, not a great statesman, by all accounts, a fairly decent guy, but not a good ruler, summons the estates general. He summons basically a, a national assembly. And uh, there's 300 members from the first estate, the clergy, 300 members from the second estate, the aristocracy, and 600 members from the third estate. But really, the only people who get to vote are the first and second. And that, again, presents another huge problem. And this really uh, leads to a, a lot of problems amongst the um, estates general. Uh, and it's really one of the things that leads directly into uh, the French Revolution and the fall of France. So the results of the revolution. First uh, and most notable result is, of course, the king is deposed. It's the end of the monarchy. Uh, they issue something that is known as the Declaration of the Rights of Man, still in use today. It's actually authored by Jean Lafayette, who, of course, participated in the American Revolution, helped us out. And even uh, a lot of a lot by uh, his good friend from the United States, Thomas Jefferson, really helped uh, with it as well. And you'll see some similarities there. Liberty, property, security, uh, the right to resist oppression. These are some of the things that are talked about in the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Also, as a result of the Revolution, feudalism is ended. Uh, there's a new government formed. They form uh, from this general assembly that Louis had called. They form the new government, and they establish, again, like Montesquieu, three branches, uh, a legislative, executive, and judicial branch of the government. They agree to release their colonies. And another big significant result of the revolution is a free public education, which has a long-lasting effect on all of Europe and in the United States. It also leads into war, the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the Reign of Terror, uh, where basically the leaders of the revolution uh, begin guillotining people that they view as hostile or not supportive enough of the French Revolution. Uh, and they go ahead and they, uh, this leads to the rise of Napoleon, to go ahead and get France back under control from the Reign of Terror and a spread of re revolutionary ideas. These are all things that come about uh, as a result of the French Revolution. We'll spend a little bit more talking uh, about directly Napoleon, some of his accomplishments. Uh, one of the things that Napoleon really does is when he takes control to kind of put down the reign of terror, uh, he takes control and he appoints all of the, the, the governors of the local provinces, he appoints all the mayors of local towns, the judges, he even appoints all the heads of police at various different points. So he really asserts a lot of central control, national control over the local governments. Um, another uh, thing Napoleon uh, really does is he establishes a public education system. Uh, the public education system where government controls all the education. He builds tons of new schools. Uh, he goes ahead and sets national standards, which elevate the standards uh, of most places. And he makes the standards uniform across the entire nation, which uh, is something that is controversial really still to this day, especially in the United States, the uniformity of standards. Uh, and, and he goes ahead and puts another piece into public education, the idea that the purpose of education is to build up 
the sense of nationalism, that France as a nation, loyalty to the nation, loyalty to the French government, in its essence indoctrinating the children uh, to go ahead and become loyal citizens. Uh, and he views this as one of the primary purposes of education. It's still one of the things that is talked about as the purpose of education today, creating good citizens. And that traces its roots all the way back to Napoleon. Uh, in religious matters, uh, Napoleon goes ahead and he kind of takes over the clergy. Uh, the state goes ahead and takes over the pay of the clergy. The church was to give up all the lands that it had. And the bishops, the people in charge of the Church of France, were supposed to be nominated again by the state. And he advocates for freedom of religion, which is kind of interesting. How is it freedom of religion if the state is paying for religion, controlling who controls the church? Sometimes those two views can kind of seem as, as, as opposites of one another. But this is one of the ways that he basically brought the church under his control and basically makes himself more or less a dictator. Uh, Napoleonic Law Code is another hugely influential development under Napoleon. It's really the basis for modern law. They go back to uh, the Justinian Code in Roman times uh, where they go ahead and they write all the laws down. Napoleonic Law Code uh, is really still the basis for a lot of the law in places in Europe and uh, most of Latin America, even in places like Louisiana, would trace its, its law system back to the Napoleonic Codes. Some of the things that, that, that established equal treatment under the law, a trial by jury, no ex post facto. Again, you start to see some of these same trends, some of the same things that you see in the United States judicial system because they're all influenced by the Enlightenment. Uh, the Napoleonic Law Code includes both civil uh, and criminal law code and, and includes fewer rights for women but increases rights for men. And the key thing to understand about Napoleonic Law is that in Napoleonic Law, the justice system is inquisitorial, not adversarial. In other words, in, a, in Napoleonic law, the judge's job is to find the facts. The judge's job is not to interpret the law and sit there and make sure everything's being done by the law. The judge, in fact, becomes not exactly a prosecutor, but is, is trying to go ahead and, and figure out what all the facts are uh, and will go ahead and render his decision from there. As opposed to, you know, in the American law system, which is common law, not Napoleonic law, ours is based off Britain, not France, where you have an adversarial one, where you have the prosecutor, you have the um, uh, the defense attorney, they argue, they have different sides, they're trying to win different points, and their jo job is to convince either the judge or a jury that they're right. Uh, whereas that's not the role so much in, in French law. In French law, the judge is really deciding what all the facts are, what all the relevant facts are, and, and sifting through them. Uh, also, Napoleon establishes things like the Legion of Honor that recognizes uh, distinguished military service and even distinguished military or civilian service in the government. Uh, so again, uh, this you know goes to the French legions and things like that. This all traces back to Napoleon. Uh, financial reforms. Napoleon establishes the National Bank of France. Again, something similar to going on in the, in the United States. And the idea of equal taxation. So uh, in other words, if somebody's taxed at 2% and they are wealthy, then somebody who's not wealthy should also be taxed at 2% or something like that so that everybody has the same uh, tax rate, is paying the same amount in taxes. One group's not taxed more than another. This is not like the American system today, which is um, a graduated tax system. So the more income you make, the higher your tax rate becomes. You pay more taxes. Uh, so again, a little bit different. Uh, also, Napoleon goes ahead and establishes lots of public works. He builds roads, uh, the Arc de Triomphe, stuff like that. Um, so different public works. Uh, and, and also, the wars that he fights really change the map of Europe. Austria decreases in its influence. It's no longer the dominant force in the Holy Roman Empire. And the German states, he actually reduces the number of German states, which leads them towards, really, unification. Uh, it's really in response to Napoleon that you get the rise of German nationalism and eventually the establishment of the country of Germany. Before that, they were always just a series of German states, Prussia being probably one of the most uh, dominant of them. Another result of the French Revolution is how it spreads around the world. The idea of equality in particular goes global. Uh, societies around the world really latch on to this idea that no, all people are equal, at least politically speaking. Uh, and so the idea of feudalism and serfdom where, hey, the idea that there's some people who can't take care of themselves and there's other people who should take care of them starts to go by the wayside. No, uh, we're all equally capable of taking care of ourselves and equally capable of deciding for ourselves what got, uh, laws govern us. Again, the Napoleonic Law Code, as I've already mentioned, spreading throughout the globe. And a big idea, state control of education. This is one that is really still with us today, uh, where nations try to go ahead and control their educational system. So the legacy of Napoleon's empire, uh, again, the birth and the rise of militarism, all the Napoleonic Wars, 
the birth and the rise of nationalism, uh, the, the belief in a nation uh, and loyalty to a nation um, or government, uh, and, and really the idea of a dictatorship. Napoleon was really kind of the first dictator uh, where, where he establishes control centrally under his authority uh, and, and he becomes has absolute power, in essence, like a king. Um, and then the taxation of conquered peoples. Uh, one of the ways Napoleon found to pay for his wars was once you conquer somebody, then you go ahead and tax them to pay for the war.